Cool. Are you guys still with me? Please, please, please. Keep up. Keep up. Um, stay with me. There's quite a few more things that I want us to still discuss. Now, we've had the opportunity of talking about um, what depreciation is. We've spoken about shortfalls. Um, we have spoken about residuals or balloon payments. We've also spoken about deposits and how those work, etc. So if you guys have any questions, please shoot some questions below and I'll be happy to answer them for you guys. The next thing I actually want to talk about is you have seen a car that you absolutely like, you absolutely love it, and you really want to apply for this car. You may not have the cash or you do have the cash, then you can just fork it out and just pay it off. Great. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people that can actually, that want to finance their cars, for example, that want to they'd want to approach a bank because we don't always have the cash sitting around or we can't always afford to pay like 300,000 Rand or 500,000 Rand or a million Rand or whatever it is out of our pockets or taking from a bank to pay off a car. I've often heard that cars are bad investments. Um, typically I kind of agree they often are bad investments, but you need to buy right and you need to know what you're doing. But at the end of the day, it's all about your happiness, whatever you deem, as um incredible amazing something that you treasure like do you man like absolutely do you and that's what i've been doing i've just been doing me all through and through so there's a car that you saw that you really like and that you really want to buy the first thing you need to be aware of is affordability so you'll often hear dealers talking about affordability or the sales guy talking about affordability and essentially what that means is are you able to afford the car that you want to buy right do you have enough revenue coming your way to be able to afford the car? Now, one of the easiest tests to see if you can actually afford the car, and they often say that you need to earn um, three times the amount of the car that you're looking to purchase. So if you want to buy a car and it's costing you five grand in terms of installments, then you need to earn a minimum of about 15,000 rand. Or alternatively, you need to have that value coming through your account. Now, there's a few tricks around it. There's a few tricks around that. But essentially, um, within your bank statements, that's what the bank needs to see is coming through your account on a regular basis. Just so they can see that you are able to afford the car. So affordability is a really big thing. Um, if, for example, you've been declined for a car and they say affordability, now you know why. And then you can kind of start to build sort of around that. How can you better or be more um, in a position to be able to afford the car that you actually um, want? But that's really just one of the most basic and easiest sort of tests to see um, for availability. In terms of affordability, um, really is are you able to afford the car? But the other part of it is you need to do your own calculation. So you've been quite interested um, in buying a car and I've seen it. It's on cars.co.za, but also Autotrader has finance calculators. So you could essentially just go onto the app and you can punch in the car that you're looking to get. Um, you may not know the interest rate that you're going to get because, of course, it's dependent on your credit record, for example, and your credit profile. You can assume that it's on essentially the highest interest rate um just put it on the worst and then at least um you kind of won't be short falling yourself if i can put it that way so um you can go onto a finance calculator you can find one on cars.co.za you can also find one on auto trader and really just punch in the value of the car that you're looking to get it'll kind of automate and let you know what you'd be looking to pay for that car on a 60 month or 72 month or whatever period um, or duration of contract or finance that you are looking for, right? Typically, I look at about a 60 or a 72 month contract. I really want to give myself the time um, to be able to, to kind of pay it off. Um, I want to stretch it on for as long as I possibly can. But again, um, typically what happens is if you can pay... Um, 
for a contract or rather an installment for a very long period in time it looks great to the banks by the way it looks absolutely great so if you get a long contract and you pay it very well and steadily there's no defaults and things like that it really does look great so typically i look at about a 60 month or a 72 month contract um which i typically look at i so wish there were sort of um more finance options but there are more coming about like bmw select there is um, Agility Finance by Mercedes and a number of others that are coming around, um, which is which is really, really cool. The next thing is um, in looking for a car, when you're about to purchase a car as well, like one of the most important things that people really underrate, especially if you're financing, is a credit record. It's a credit record and a credit score. So essentially what a credit record is, it's a record of all your past sort of credits that you have received or been approved for. Um, and it also then sort of tabulates and includes um, sort of all your credit payments, for example, like how they've been performing, whether you've been paying them, whether you've not been paying them, for example. What it also includes as part of your credit record is the number of inquiries. Now, I want to talk about inquiries. So I'm one of those people that loves to shop a lot. So I like searching online. Um, I like looking at cars. But the problem is, as soon as I see something that I really like, I'm like, ooh, I want to go for you. Ooh, I want to go for you. And in in my excitement at the time and at the moment, what I do is I literally pounce and I'm like, okay, cool. Give me this car. I can put down this deposit. I want to structure this kind of deal. And what that does is it logs an inquiry onto your credit record. And while you're on your pursuit and on your search, you'll be like, actually... I don't really like the car as much as I thought I do after thorough research and talking to other car lovers and just checking the market. I kind of don't think that I actually want to own that car. It looks great. I want to test drive it. I might want to drive it for a month, but I don't really want to own the car. Um, I've already made an inquiry. I kind of withdraw that inquiry. But what that inquiry does is it logs on your credit record and it lives there for a period of about 12 months. Now, I can talk about how you remove it and stuff like that, but what's really important to note is that as soon as you see something that you really like, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that that is the only application that you're going to be putting forward. Because the more applications that you put forward, what it essentially does is it logs queries or inquiries on your record, which then reduces your credit score. Now, what your credit score is, and it typically goes from about 500 to about 999 or 1,000, and you are essentially scored on your credit performance and how well you, you pay for your credits and things like that. So it's really important that that stays as high as possible because that then allows you the ability to get the finance. So that's one of the things that banks look for. So after banks have looked at your affordability, for example, they then look at your credit record, they look at your credit score, and you need to make sure that that is often kept very clean. Now, you can always call TransUnion to remove the inquiries. They can only remove about 10 inquiries um, a day because you've been shopping you'll have to call them the next day to remove all the others because there's been a number of cars that you've been applying for and a number of cars that you have liked so there is a way that they can remove those so another thing as well that could affect quite a number of people is defaults now this is a huge issue you need to make sure that you if you've got any finance and if you've got any credit whether it's a cell phone whether it's a car whether it's your bond Whatever it is, if you are paying that, you need to make sure that you do not skip a payment, you do not miss a payment. Absolutely at all. So I'm the kind of person that keeps their money in one account, but also has a transactional account in one account. And I kind of keep my debit orders in the one account. And I often need to transfer across these accounts. And what may happen is... Um, a payment may pull on a certain date, whether it be like the 25th, 26th, 1st or whatever, on an odd day and I haven't provisioned for that cash to be there, um, that then becomes an issue because if that amount bounces on my statement, for example, or on my account, let's start there. If it really bounces on my account, it really looks bad on my part. Even if they were able to sort of redeem those funds, maybe I paid it directly to them or 
24 hours later, they kind of ran the debit order again and then it came off. It still reflects um, as a defaulted payment because the debit order instruction um, or rather the debit order was released and the instruction was out there, but the payment wasn't received at the time. So you really need to be careful around defaults and payments. So whatever contractual agreements around credit that you get yourself in, you need to make sure absolutely that that is paid off because that's going to be one of the biggest things they look at. So once they've looked at affordability, um, they once they've looked at your credit score, your credit record, um, that's the next thing that they look at. That's the next thing they look at, which is like defaults. And something else that I want to chat about in terms of your credit score as well, your defaults do, do show up there. Um, what you can do is every month you accumulate a certain number of points that then go towards your credit score. So if you are paying your bills, for example, uh, you're up to date, everything is great. You will grow in the level that you are at, for example, um, which is cool. So I would encourage everyone to kind of be at about I'd, I'd probably say a really good rate um, is looking at anything from about uh, 680 or about 700 right through to right through to a thousand try stay within that band um, but being within the sort of 800 or 850 towards uh, towards a thousand band I'd probably say you're doing pretty well uh, but you can then accumulate those points. You can you can gain those points. So don't be discouraged if, for example, your credit record or your credit score um, has has been affected by some sort of payment. So you really do need to guard that with your life, um, for example, and just make sure that it is always in good standing um, and it is always up to date because it is one of the things that they look at um, when you're looking for financing and you really don't want to um, apply for a car and become disappointed because they're saying your credit score isn't great enough um, because of some payment that came off. And what typically happens is um, there are a number of companies that kind of do it illegally. They kind of just check your credit, your credit score and kind of pull your details. Again, that drops your your, your credit score kind of value as well. So there could be a call center that's calling you and saying, you've been pre-approved for this particular deal. And you just like, how, how do you guys even know that? So what some of them do is they already pull your record and they already have an idea to say that, Oh, okay. Um, this person can afford our offering and that's why we're going to contact them. And essentially they've had to pull from your record or rather log an inquiry, which then affects your credit score. So just be aware of that and some of those things. So another thing that you'll really have to do, and I feel that people don't do enough of, and that is negotiating. You can always walk into a dealership, walk into a branch, and begin to negotiate and begin to put the most ideal deal together for you um, and kind of put those pillars in place for your deal to actually happen. So what I find really fascinating um, is that a lot of people don't really negotiate. You walk into a dealership, you do an application, you're just like, oh, okay, cool. I'll sign on the dotted line and I'll be happy with that. You are able to negotiate and you you do have that leeway to negotiate, especially, especially, especially if you're buying in cash. If you're buying that car in cash, you can negotiate. Or if you have got a substantial deposit or even any deposit, you can negotiate. For example, if you want to buy, again, a car, worth 500,000 Rand or a million Rand, for example, and you have got a 20% deposit. And if you're buying at a million Rand, you got a 20% 20, 20 deposit, you got 200K there, um, and the car goes for about a million Rand, you can ask for a discount. You can say, I've got a 20% deposit and I'd like a discount on this car. So obviously they'll let you know um, if you are being ridiculous and if they can't meet your request, they'll let you know, but you will find that they are often very happy to say, sure, you can get 30,000 Rand or for 50,000 Rand or for example, or 60,000 Rand or whatever that value is and however convincing you are or depending on what value they've got in the car and how much markup they're making and how it's priced, etc. 
they will be very, very obliged to say, cool, we can give you X amount of money. Again, um, I don't want to tell you what that means because that's 30 grand or 50 grand or 60 grand or whatever of your finance amount, which again puts you in a better position. So a lot more people need to learn how to negotiate um, when they are busy putting their deal together. So another thing that... Um, people don't do enough of as well is checking the interest rate um, on their contracts. Now, there are two kinds of interest rates. There is a linked interest rate and a fixed interest rate. The fixed interest rate stays the same throughout the duration or the period of your contract. And a linked interest rate is essentially linked to the market. So that allows for fluctuation. So you could, for example, have signed your contract or rather got your contract at a time where you got a favorable uh, sort of interest rate. It could have been like a 10 and a half percent, for example. And because it is linked to the market and the industry, it would fluctuate. So essentially you could end up at a 12%. And what that means is you eventually pay more interest or a 13%, you eventually pay more interest. So you don't really want that. You're always just hoping and praying that it doesn't go up in value. So one of the other things I learned when I was getting my second car, for example, is I had um, an interest rate, which was quite favorable, or rather I thought it was favorable. I had about a 12%. I then later learned that it is decent, but it is quite high, actually. It is quite high. I learned that through the time, but my interest rate was then... Um, linked to the market and what had happened was I had an installment and I think I was paying about five and a half at the time and after the interest rates went up is I was essentially paying about six and a half or, or, or 6.8 or something like that so it had gone up by like a good like literally like a good sort of 1.2 1.3 and I was like oh crap this is what they actually meant when they said it was it was really linked to the market. So do be careful around that. Um, if you do have an option, please make sure that you go for a fixed interest rate. And typically I've seen about a 10.2 till about like a 13.5 sort of percent when it comes to interest rates. Um, try to get as close to the 10 mark as you possibly can. And again, the interest rate depends on your credit record, your credit score, affordability, and a whole number of sort of metrics that form part of um, that interest rate. So if you've been behaving and are in good standing, for example, when it comes to your finances, so you'll find that you will get quite, quite a nice and quite a, a favorable sort of interest rate when it comes to that. So another question that I often get is, is it important or is it more valuable to buy a brand new car versus a second hand or a used car? Now, if there is a car out there that you absolutely love, that you want to keep forever, it could be your first car, or it is like one of those cars that you want to have in your collection and you want to buy that um, brand new and it's absolutely necessary for you to buy that brand new, I would certainly say then go for it. It makes it makes incredible sense. Or if you're one of those people that say, I want to step into a new car, I don't want to step into a car that's been driven by someone else. It kind of feels like it's been slept in, used. You just feel like it's kind of filthy. So if you're one of those people and you do insist on buying brand new, then great. That's absolutely good for you. Go for it. But I often encourage people to buy secondhand or to buy used. If you're not too sentimental, for example, and you about the car that you're gonna get and you don't or don't foresee yourself kind of keeping it forever, then getting a used car I think is better for you. A lot of the cars that I have bought have been demo cars or used cars, which is great. I kind of love buying demo. So demo with about 5,000 Ks on the clock, the car's already been run in, for example. Um, it's like a year later. And what that really allows me to do, kind of buying a car that's like a year old. So if the model, we now in obviously 2020, if the model is a 2019, um, 
or rather late 2018 then that i do um that i do really like to kind of buy that because what typically happens is when you buy your car brand new it kind of goes through the first year to about a year and a half um depreciating so it experiences some of its sort of biggest depreciation um around the first sort of year year and a half so i want to make sure that i've skipped that period and often what you find is when once you've skipped that period um you then able to buy the car at quite a quite a quite a dope price you are able to get the car at quite a decent price and you'll probably be happy at how much you're getting the car for because again it's already gone past its sort of initial um depreciation phase it's obviously still going to depreciate but the rate at which it's going to depreciate it's not going to be like the rate um of the first years like cars experience like some of the biggest um depreciations within the first year so that's one of the reasons, again, why I feel like buying a car as a demo, for example, secondhand is often, it's often best. But again, I'm not buying to keep within my collection. I'm still putting together the cars that I want as part of my collection. I'm not quite there yet. I do want a supercar collection um, of just supercars, supercars only because I want to buy cars as appreciating assets, for example, as investment. So that's really what I'm looking to do. So again, if you do want to buy brand new, great, awesome, go for it. Um, and those are your ideas around it. Sure. But if you do have the option, do look at getting, um, secondhand. 